Um, today's section is kind of unusual. The topic is implicit differentiation and you may be scooped back like a foot. I feel like these cables get closer and closer to me. Thank you. Uh, oh, these don't have wheels. So moving them is a little... Uh, oh, they do have wheels. The wheels just start rolling. Okay, anyway. <laughs> implicit differentiation is unusual compared to what we've done so far because these are derivatives when we don't have uh, a function. And that's an odd thing to talk about because the definition of the derivative involves functions. Remember that the definition of the derivative is the limit as h approaches zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all divided by h and you've you've got these f's and those are functions so it's built right into the definition of the derivative at the same time, you know, we talked about the derivative geometrically. And we said that the derivative is the slope of the tangent line. And if I were to guess where you heard the phrase tangent line for the first time, it would be in a geometry class, looking at lines tangent to circles. And a circle is not a function, <coughs> if you can recall the vertical line test from elementary algebra, the reason that a circle is not a function is that you can draw a vertical line that touches the curve in more than one place. Any graph with that property is not the graph of a function. So you've got this kind of weird dichotomy where on the one hand, the um, circles have tangent lines and these tangent lines certainly have slopes. So we can talk about the slope of the tangent line, but we've defined the slope of the tangent line in terms of function notation and circles aren't functions. How do we get around this, this conflict? Let me 
before I go any further, make the observation that this is not some special property that circles alone have. I mean, if you draw this curve and you select a point, you can draw the tangent line of the point. And this curve is a function. And the slope of the tangent line is the derivative. But now let's take this curve and let's make it do a loop. Well, suddenly, this is no longer a function. Suddenly, you can draw vertical lines that touch the curve in multiple places. But you've still got that tangent line there. It still has a slope. The fact that I messed around with the function a little to the right of it shouldn't be changing anything. And our solution to this problem is a little funny sounding when we say it out loud. Our solution to this problem is to pretend that y equals f of x is a function even when it isn't. which doesn't seem like much of a solution for a mathematical difficulty, kind of closing our eyes and hoping it goes away. But remember that the definition of the derivative is a local definition. That is to say, if we have a curve and we have some value x that we're interested in, we're only interested in what the curve is doing near x. That's part of taking this limit as h approaches zero. If h is close to zero, we're only looking at the part of that curve near x. So here, no, here, if we're taking the derivative at that point and we're trying to find the slope of the tangent line, then we only really care what's happening near that point. This addition to the curve I made, this addition in blue, is far away from the point. It's not affecting the derivative. What if we just erased it? Oops, went a little too far. There. What if we just erased it? Well, now we have a function. We have the point we're interested in. The slope of the tangent line is the derivative. So that's sort of our strategy. We say, okay, suppose we have a curve and a point we're interested in, and then some distance away from the point, 
the curve does something that stops it from being a function. It maybe goes down, so we no longer pass the vertical line test, or it loops around, so we no longer pass the vertical line test. Well, if we're interested in the derivative at this point, we are only asking what happens near that point, and we can erase this stuff far away from the point. Or going back to my circle example, Let's say we have a circle. Or as close to a circle as I can get freehanded. And we have a point on the circle. And we want to talk about the tangent line. Well, the circle doesn't have a derivative, properly speaking, because it's not a function. But if we just erased the part of the curve far away from the point in question, it would become a function, and we could talk about the derivative. So that's the theoretical sort of underpinnings of all of this. We haven't addressed the concrete question of, okay, so what does that mean? Like, if we take a derivative, how do we do it? Before we get into those sort of concrete computational questions. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> Sorry, my voice is going about what we've said so far. Then, let's, let's introduce this concept of, of Sorry, my, uh, oh, it's maybe because of that. Yeah, sorry, having a little trouble changing the uh, pen color. Let's introduce this via an example. Let's say we have x squared plus y squared equals 1 which you might recognize as the equation of a circle, radius 1 centered at the origin. And um, let's ask what the tangent line is at a point. What is the tangent line at one over the square root of two, comma, one over the square root of two? So that is a point on the unit circle. It's around there. So there is a tangent line at that point. We want the tangent line. What that really means as far as heavy lifting goes is that we need to find the slope of the tangent line. Once we've found the slope, we can use the point slope form to sort of answer this question 
very quickly. So, in terms of work that's to be done, we need the slope, and we know that the um, slope of a tangent line is the derivative. So we need to find the derivative, and we need to plug that point into it. And we need to find the derivative even though we don't have a function. Let's enumerate our steps here. We've got an equality. I mean, we don't have a function, but if we've got a curve, that curve is defined by something equaling something else. So, step one. Take the derivative of both sides of the equality. So Back in, we're back in algebra, and we're trying to solve an equality, and we're doing the same thing to both sides. We're adding something, or multiplying something, or in this case, taking the derivative of both sides the derivative of x squared plus y squared, the derivative of 1. And then we've got this kind of note, 1a we can call it, Treat y as if it were a function. And that uh, Part of the process might still be a little unclear. Let's go to the next frame and let's take some of these derivatives. The derivative of x squared is 2x. No sweat. The derivative of 1 is 0. And then we've got this derivative of y to the second power, and I've said to treat y like a function, and I'm going to take that derivative, first of all, so we're all on the same page, and then I'm going to discuss it. I'm going to discuss it further. 2x plus 2 times y times y prime equals 0. Well, the 2 times y doesn't look like it requires comment. That's just the power rule. What about that y prime? Well, this is the chain rule. Suppose you have, let's just look at a few examples. Suppose you're taking the derivative 
of a function squared. Let's say we were taking the derivative of the sine of x squared. Then if you haven't done this quiz, again, this is vitally important material, don't sleep on it. The chain rule gives you the two times the sine times the derivative of the sine. Or say we had the derivative of the natural log of x squared. The chain rule would give us 2 times the natural log of x times 1 over x. This 1 over x is the derivative of the inside function. So now going back to this example, we're treating y as a function of x. The chain rule says, okay, take the derivative, but make sure you multiply by the derivative of this inside function, by this y prime, just like when we had these concrete examples, we multiplied by the derivative of the sine, and we multiplied by the derivative of the natural logarithm. Here, we multiply by the derivative of y. What is the derivative of y, though? Well, that's exactly what we were trying to figure out. So, step two in this process is going to be to solve for y prime. Just do some algebra. We'll get 2y, y prime by itself on the left of this equation, and then we'll use division to get y prime by itself. The two up top and the two below will cancel. And I got a little careless with my notation. That's why prime there on the left. So y prime equals negative x divided by y. And you'll notice that now our derivative has both x's and y's in it, whereas we're used to our derivative just having x's in it. And this is a signature of implicit differentiation. This was something I expected to happen. Now that we know that y prime is negative x over y, well, I've got a specific point I'm interested in, 1 over the square root of 2 comma 1 
over the square root of 2. I plug in my x, and I plug in my y, and I find that the derivative is negative 1. The x and the y coordinates are the same, so when you do that division, you get 1, and then there's that negative sign out front. And the slope of the tangent line is then in point-slope form this. You might want to uh, might want to rewrite this y minus one over the square root of two is negative x plus one over the square root of two, and then we can add one over the square root of two to both sides. And I would probably leave that be the sort of high school algebra idea that we must not have a square root in the denominator of a fraction never really struck me as being a real thing that anybody needs to care about. And let's check our work. Hopefully this is all good, but never hurts to check. And being wrong would also be a learning experience. We'll go to desmos.com. Here's The circle. Let's zoom in on this. One over the square root of two, comma, one over the square root of two is indeed a point on the circle. And now let me see, what was it? Y equals negative x. Let me make these be the same color. Oops. Y equals negative x plus 2 over the square root of 2. And this definitely looks like the tangent line. It's a line that just there the brushes past the circle and just touches it at this one point. So that process seems to have worked out. And the general idea behind this process is going to keep on being used in the word problems and story problems that we're doing later in the week. So it's important to at least have this general idea nailed down. Let's look at another example. Maybe a slightly messier example. The sine of xy equals x minus y. And I might uh, have to <coughs> fiddle around with this example a little. It's very easy to accidentally write down equations that don't actually have any 
solutions, but that did not happen here. Here's what the graph of this curve looks like. It isn't the function we can draw a, let's see, draw a vertical line that touches the curve in multiple places. This vertical line touches it in three places. But we can still ask about the derivative. And let's see, it looks like this goes through the point to zero comma zero. So maybe let's specifically ask, what's the slope of the tangent line at zero comma zero. And just, you need to be careful. Um, I'm not teaching you any really grand new mathematics, just um, there are a bunch of steps with this implicit differentiation. It's easy to do something wrong in step two, and then 10 steps later, you're getting gibberish and you don't know why. So that's, let's copy this down. Let's see, is it x minus y? It's x minus y. And let's take the derivative of both sides. On the left, we have um, a composition. We've got that sign on the outside and we've got this xy on the inside. So what the chain rule says is we should take the derivative of that outside thing. The derivative of the sine is the cosine. And then we should take the derivative of that inside function. On the right, the derivative of x is 1. What's the derivative of y? Well, the derivative of y is y prime. That's exactly what we're trying to find out. So we'll just write that. The derivative of y is y prime. Now, now for the product rule. Inside the, this derivative, we have one expression being multiplied by a second expression. So we need the product rule here. The derivative of x is one, that y gets left alone. Now this x gets left alone, 
and we don't know what the derivative of y is. That's precisely what we're trying to find out. And now we sort of have a choice, I guess. Um, well, that's, uh, I said that, that step two is to solve for y prime. We could do that. It's not going to be lovely looking, but there's nothing stopping us from first distributing this multiplication over this addition. And we get y times the cosine of xy plus xy prime times the cosine of xy equals one minus y prime. Then as ugly as this is, it's not, um, not as ugly as it seems, we want y prime by itself on one side of the equality. So we could add y prime to both sides. We could combine our y primes. Uh, I guess I've come this far. I might as well do all this stuff I'm talking about. It's would be very difficult to go to another frame and keep going. Let me even though ordinarily working up instead of down is not the not the best practice. Let's take this thing and start working with it. We can add y prime to both sides. Let's also mess around with color to try to stop stuff from bleeding together. We've got x y prime times the cosine of xy still on the left. On the right, we have that one, and let's take this and subtract it over. Then group our y primes together. So you see, I sort of said this way back in the first week that a lot of times the hardest part of calculus had nothing to do with calculus. It was just a bunch of very ugly algebra. Where'd you get the one from on the left side? Um, I've got a y prime here and I've got a y prime there and I'm factoring gotcha. those two out. On the very bottom one, did you just factor the y out too? I, uh, I distributed. Oh, okay. Okay. So, on the right, we still have this. And then we can divide by 
one plus x times the cosine of x y and we get this is thickly offensive but uh this answer we on the right we have one minus y times the cosine of x y and we're dividing by one plus x times the cosine of x y lord and there's the derivative and now we can plug zero comma zero into it Obviously, don't erase stuff, and I'm assuming in your notes they're just going straight down and not erasing stuff. When we plug in x equals 0, y equals 0, what happens? We get 1 over 1. So hopefully that derivative is one. If not, an object lesson in some kind of little algebraic error. y equals x. I think that should be the tangent line, and, and it is the tangent line. Maybe a little easier to see. I mean, obviously, at least for non-colorblind students, if we let the colors be different, this very much looks like a tangent line. We've got this curve, and then we've got this straight line that just brushes up against the curve and then keeps going. <clears throat> what I was starting to say, I was sort of starting to say something, and then I stopped, and then I said, oh, well, we might as well finish doing what we're doing. But all of that algebra might not be necessary. I mean, we've got this curve, we're only interested in a single point. We take the derivative. We already did this once, so I'm moving quickly. The derivative gives us, I mean, if I hadn't had to erase stuff for space, I wouldn't be doing this at all. And in spite of my saying that, okay, as your last step, you should solve for y prime, there's nothing stopping you from just sticking x and y in there now if you want. If you let x be a zero, and you let y be a zero, now well, what happens? You have the cosine of zero, which is one times zero plus zero times y prime. So that 
all turns to zero equals one minus y prime. Zero equals one minus y prime. Add y prime to both sides of this equality. Y prime equals one, a uh, much quicker and smoother process. And it all depends on what you want the derivative for. I mean, if you're genuinely only interested in knowing what happens at a single point, there might not be a lot of utility to solving for y prime. If you're, you know, writing a computer program and you're going to need like 5,000 different inputs and you're going to want to store all of those outputs, you're going to want to end up solving for y prime. So you can just write y prime is stored as, and then that equation. It all kind of depends on what your goal is. And that's sometimes a problem with math classes. I've never discovered the solution, but you're presenting all of this stuff without a clearly defined goal. And it sometimes makes it hard to know what to do. Do you want to solve for y prime? Do you just want to stick zero, zero in as quickly as possible? In any event, it is 9.50 or 9.46, so I'll see you tomorrow.